Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Um, compression. Lossless compression of LES files. Um, that's what we'll be talking about. Um, I don't think I need to motivate LiDAR data all that much in front of this crowd. So we've been collecting it a lot and more. In the beginning, people stored it as ASCII. And I know there's some of you in the audience who may still do. Shame on you. Um, because it's inefficient to parse, seek, and store. And uh, wonderfully, um, somebody had a very early idea to come up with a standard that was binary and efficient to parse, and yet simple enough for people to use. And that was the uh, laser format, or LAS format, uh, the ASPRS created. And uh, it basically has become a standard for exchanging the one on mobile data collects. Um, let's look at the point representations that we usually have. I mean, the first uh, files I got LIDAR, that stored LIDAR looked kind of like this. You had X, Y, Z, and maybe intensity, and then a lot of numbers. And you look at that picture, and instantly you know there's something wrong. Because if that's stored in meters, you know, it looks like my lasers give me nanometer accuracy. So clearly there's way too much precision there, so I should get rid of a lot of those digits. Because if we're compressing, there's no sense of compressing scanner noise or data that's not there. So it's very important to, to know how much precision is in your data. So assuming we have centimeter precisions, which is currently usually good enough, um, you notice that most numbers start with the same few digits. So if we just would store an offset in the beginning of the file, like I show here, you could basically get rid of all these numbers that are just getting repeated over and over again. And you get smaller numbers, and it's very easy to get the original number, just add the offset back in. Now the only thing I don't like so much is that decimal point. Not that it ever did anything bad to me, but it makes things more complicated when you store data. So we can quickly get rid of it by just adding another piece of information in the header. We just put a scale there. And once we have that, we can get rid of that decimal point and just store integers. And now we have a very wonderful format for storing um, scanned points, integers, scaled and offset integers. And that's the correct way to store them. People will say, why don't you just store them as flows? You get more precision that way. And uh, that's sort of, I'm on a mission to get rid of that thinking because it's wrong. Floating point numbers don't give you more precision for sto storing uniformly sampled LiDAR data. So why? Well, let's look at the floating point numbers. You have a one sign bit, exp exponent, and the mantissa. The mantissa is where the real data sort of gets uh, specified. That's where all the numbers get stored. And the first two sort of say where the numbers are. Um, and between 64 and 128, and that area is specified by the first nine bits, you have 23 bits of precision. That means you have above 8 million different numbers. So your interval size is 64 divided by 8 million. For, for the next big one, um, you have 128, and it's divided by 8.3 million. That gives you a sampling distance of you know, 0.01 millimeters. That's very precise. Yeah, floating point is very precise, especially around zero, because that's where most of the precision is. But when you store your LiDAR data, most of the time, your numbers are very big. And because there's so much precision at zero, there's very little precision far away from zero. So between 2 million and 4 million, you also only have 8 million different numbers. But that means your spacing is 25 centimeters. And above 4 million, your spacing is half a meter. So if you store your, your floats, your noising and leasing as floats, you basically quantize them as a half meter level, and that's not very good. So forget about floating points for storing coordinates. And the wonderful thing about the LAS format is you don't have any chance. You can't store floats, and that's why I liked the format so much when it first came out and decided to compress it. Um, the scale factor and the offset I showed in the initial example are right here in the LAS header. 
And if you look at the point records, right now there are sort of four point records that get regularly used. You have these three integers that get scaled and offset by the header in the beginning of every point record. And that's the majority of the data. All right, I just had to get that off my chest now. So, now we have a lot of those points, billions of them. Um, when I started out, I got the data set, I think it was from Duke University, uh, that uh, was just one river basin, and it was half a billion points, and that, whoa, that was huge, it was all ASCII and that. Uh, but since then, people have just, you know, gotten crazy with collecting points. Uh, these are just some numbers I got from uh, people over the last few days about some point holdings. Uh, yeah, that's a lot of data, so it's uh, obviously to think about compression. You know, everybody uses compression, you know, every day in, in their lives, and you all used to uh, the digital compression schemes we use every day. A lot of people still send me WinBit files, and uh, whenever I go uh, diving, you know, I take a lot of compression. Yeah, with me, compression is great. What does it mean for points? For point compression, you have a number of qualities that can be distinguished. You have lossy and lossless. In our case, we want lossless. The lossy schemes are usually used in the visualization community, where you really just want sort of a, you know, you want to look at the points. Um, but um, in our case, we want to just store the same data we get off the scanner in exactly the same way. We don't want to mess with the data. Then you have progressive with a single rate. Progressive means as your points sort of come in off this, you can get a preview, of course a preview. Um, we're really looking at a single rate compressor that just gives you the same as an LES file, which doesn't have progressive uh, transmission uh, or access, but you get it much more compressed. Streaming versus non-streaming. Non-streaming point compressors need to store all the points in memory in order to decompress them, or need to store data structure on the order of the points. There are a number of schemes out there that do that, and that's not very practical if you have a billion of points, because you can't keep them in memory. So we want a streaming scheme. Most point compressors permute the points, because they say, well, you know, I'll give you all the points in the original quality, but they'll give them back to you in a different order, in an order that compresses well. I would like to do that, but I can't, because when somebody hands me a file, and I say loss of compression, they went back to the exact same file after the decompressing it. So I need to preserve the order. And ideally, I can also access the file randomly, because if it's a very big file of two gigabytes, I don't want to have to sequentially decompress it to get to a point that's at the end. And of course, the other um, things are ratio and speed. I want high compression ratio and fast speeds. In computer graphics, there have been a lot of schemes, and they either are progressive, non-streaming, or most of them, or actually all of them, they don't preserve the point order. Meaning, they put a, their own ordering on the points that compress as well. Um, we don't have that option for last year. So our direct competitors are WinZip. Most of the time when people send me um, LiDAR files, they just WinZip them. Then there's WinRAF, which is actually better. And then uh, people ask me a lot about this one. Uh, Lizard Text LiDAR compressor, uh, very nicely integrated into the Mr. Sid framework. Uh, comes at a bit of a price tag. And then there's some uh, software uh, out of uh, uh, Research Institute uh, that uh, implements the technique by these guys, Mongus and Dalek. They use very similar technique than we do. Uh, they use predictive compression. And I'll just briefly talk about predictive compression and then I'll spare you all the details and go directly into the, what we can get out of it. So prediction means you have a good idea what the next thing may be, and then there is the actual coordinate that you really have. So instead of storing the real thing, you store the difference. In this case, the difference is 19. How would you store the difference? Well, in my case, I say the difference can be expressed with five bits, and then I express the difference. That's sort of 
what the last slip does under the hood. Why is it a good idea? Well, if you look at the coordinate distribution and you look at the corrected distribution, you know there's a big difference. What's good about this? Well, if you entropy code it, you really want a symbol distribution that looks like this, because you can't comp and compress it like this. As more as your symbols are spread out equally, the less compression, the more expensive it becomes to compress every symbol. That's sort of just you know, an, an intuitive idea, while you want to have small residuals that spread around zero. Alright, so we can't change the order. That is uh, the underlying uh, restriction we have. But not all hope is lost, because most large files have a certain structure to them, and we're going to expect that structure. And the structure is, we have acquisition coherence. The files are stored in the way they're acquired. And, uh, and nobody messed around with the order too much. So that's the typical way the LIDAR comes off the scanner, in scan lines. And you, you see, just from looking at it, that there got to be a lot of coherence in that data. And that prediction schemes that sort of predict the next point as a previous point, plus some little you know, twists and so on, must work quite well, because these points are very correlated. And that's basically what we expect. LASIK is designed to work best if the points that come in are in the original scanline order. If you get the flight lines, one flight line per LAS file, you're going to get the best compression. But that's not always how it is in practice. So these are just some of your files I got. Here you sort of get something like this, and there's some other overlap data that comes afterwards. Or you get uh, an order like that. Um, where you wonder, I don't know really what happened, but then the, the yellow came first and the black came and all the other stuff comes. But still, there's some coherence in there. Also, it comes in several, uh, in several runs. Here's a nice data set. Uh, you see that some tiling has happened. But if you look exactly within every tile, you can still see the scanline order. So, you know, there's some tiling and it was put back together without really, really restoring the original scan lines. And then you have some data like this. This I really don't like. When people saw it along one, one axis, these are the data I like less. And that has to do with the, with the jumping around that happens along that scan line, which makes compression a little difficult for all but the sorted axis. So, just very, very briefly the details. There's a paper uh, that you can download which has every detail about the compressor. Um, Lasik writes the LES head out compressed. Just write, changes a single bit to make sure you don't uh, try to read the file with a regular last reader. Then it writes the points in chunks. By default, in chunks of 50,000. Uh, 50, but then you can change that. The first point just gets stored raw. Raw as binary. And every other point, so the after with the 4,090, the 94,000, the 49,999 points get actually compressed uh, with prediction coding. And there are some strategies that I'm using, uh, you know, a switch based on return numbers and because uh, there are some correlations that you have between intensities, which return you are, and so on. Um, the coordinates are predicted with delta coding and with simple difference coding. And the GPS times, those are the most tricky um, because those really hamper the lizard tech coder. Um, I just uh, treat them as integers and then try to predict the time steps between the points. If you want more information, uh, it's really very detailed in the paper or in the code, since the code is online. Now I said to you, I'll do it in points of, in blocks of 5,000 points. 
Why in blocks of 5,000 points? Uh, can you read that? Yeah. So here we have a compressed file. They're called LEZ instead of LEZ. And if you just want to know the size, you can run the last step. Um, and just see the option minus size, and it doesn't actually decompress it. It will tell you know if you uncompress it, you need 3.5 gigabytes, and it's only 420 megabytes um, right now. Um, we need the blocks in order to be able to have a random access. And you notice this LAX file. And this little LAX file is actually a spatial indexing file. It's very small, but it tells you where points are in the file. And whenever this file is in the path, oops, then all last tools will automatically um, notice that we have spatial indexing and will use it whenever required. So here you have this data set that is 3.5 gigabytes uncompressed. And I have an option to visualize with uh, spatial quadri. That's the option. I'll turn on and off. You can visualize the underlying quadri that gets used whenever you do a spatial query. And uh, what that quadri basically does for every cell, it tells you which points you need to load. For example, for this cell here, it will need to load all these points. So it's, it's very generous, you know, it, it, it loads too much rather than too little because it doesn't want to have a ton of little seeks. And usually people read laser points in large chunks, like millions, not a few hundred. But this indexing information is really useful because it tells you where in the point, where in the file stuff is. So if, for example, if you use the, the GUI for last tools, it's now showing you this file and it uses the spatial indexing to show you where the data really is. And now, this here is at the very, very end of this file. And if I just want to look at that data, I just put a little uh, box around it. Yeah, I just want to look at this one. Um, then you can directly, in the compressed file, jump to that area and decompress it. And only that part, and not the rest of the file. Which is very efficient to work with, with uh, with large files. Alright, this is uh, just to give you some uh, insight why we do it in chunks of 5,000 points. So, let's look at some uh, results. Um, when I started out, uh, Liblas created this sample uh, file uh, repository where all kind of people unloaded whatever last files they had access to, because in the early days there wasn't so much. Yeah. And there's an interesting smorgasbord of files. Some are really weird, some are just normal. Uh, so I downloaded those, and uh, they are together 2.4 gigabytes. And if you just zip them, they go down to about half. So zip, you probably know this, gives you about half of the file size compression. Um, that is actually a very poor choice. WinRAR is excellent. Um, it takes very long, but they do some really cool magic in there. Nobody knows what they do because it's a proprietary code by, I think, two Russian brothers. Um, but it does a very fine job um, to uh, compress. Then there's this approach called last compression uh, by uh, the authors I mentioned before that do a similar algorithm to LASIT. Um, you see that here? It's uh, significantly slower than the last, and the exact numbers you find in the paper. Um, uh, and here you have Mr. Fit, you know, the lizard tech glider compressor, and then you have uh, last it. Um, gives you, you know, compresses it down to 15% uh, of the original size. So the first large scale glider campaign was done at uh, Department of Natural Resources in Minnesota. They are basically in the process of publishing, I think, the entire state online on an FTP server. And uh, I noticed they have a large amount of LIDAR, so I said, hey, you want to try LAZ? 
and uh, they started compressing a few counties and they got really nice compression rates because they had the original flight orders and Minnesota has lots of farmland. In farmland you just have one return and uh, the next return is very easy to predict from the previous return. And they got average compression rates from 1 to, one to 12. So here you see uh, the 12 counties that three 30 billion points and they compressed down from uh, 776 gigabytes to 64 gigabytes. And uh, the Department of Natural Resources has stopped offering LAS and they only offer LAZ now because it takes such a load off their servers. And uh, you can get a lot of uh, that uh, data at that mm -hmm. web address. So I'm using that data in the next test when I put the uh, lizard tag head to head against last lip. Let's just have a look. The top five um, um, look like this. Um, typical Minnesota farmland, you know, a few farms here and there with some trees around them, an occasional river and some stores, but mostly flat land. So all the top five is pretty much farmland. And the bottom five, um, by the way, all these images are rendered with, uh, with last grip from last tools that do different things like point densities, overlapping, uh, intensities, standard deviations, and so on. Oops. So here, let's look at this one. Here you have a lot more vegetation. And uh, those won't compress quite nice because when you have vegetation, then you never know where the lighter point is gonna, uh, where the laser is gonna hit the vegetation. So points jump up and down, and that's harder to compress. So that's what the top, uh, the bottom five look like. So, there we go, last of the light attack. Um, in terms of compression, uh, it's, uh, the Mr. 6 format has a big um, problem, and that's the compression of GPS time. I mean, most of the, of, of, of the lag behind LAZ is the GPS time. They just use deflate for compressing the GPS time, and that really hurts them. Um, other than that, the time. Uh, so uh, the encoding time last slip was about 20 times faster to encode and on the decoding was about 3 times faster. What about the other data set? Well, we had a lot of forest. Well then, LAZ format doesn't compress quite as good as before, but neither does uh, Mr. Sid format because it's more difficult to compress. But again, uh, on the encoding times and that the throughput, you know, usually also matters if you run on a lot of data. Again, uh, the last encoder does quite a bit better than the Mr. Sid format. I should point out that Mr. Sid also computes the spatial indexing at the same time and stores that, but that's not included. So that little LAX file that I had before, if you add that to these rates, it will hardly increase because it's really tiny uh, for the LAZ files. And the computation of it is almost, costs almost nothing. Um, this chunking I mentioned before, we, we don't compress all the points in one run, we compress it in chunks of 50,000. You say, why 50,000? Uh, well, 50,000 seemed to work okay for me. Um, and I did some test runs with 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 75,000, 100,000. And you sort of see, there's not much sense in compressing higher than 50,000 because the compression gain at this point is almost nothing. So if you have expect very fine granular access to your LiDAR, maybe you should go down to 20k or 10k. You can do that with the command line option. But for most people that compress LiDAR in terms of millions of points, I think uh, access in increments of 50k points is, is reasonable. All right, now uh, another quick demo. Um, that's the GUI for last tools. I mean, most people know last tools as uh, something where you have to open the command line. And uh, okay, I heard you, and so I did build a rudimentary GUI that basically translates the button settings into into uh, calls, so you can here select files. Um, let's see. Let's directly work with the LAZ file. 
So you can put in a LiDAR, a, a wildcard here, press return, now you get all these flag lines. Um, you see these dotted points here, that's because last tools can also do control point checks. Um, for example, you can go here to the LAS control, and you can uh, see if that works. Run control. I should have tested that first. Um, so now we have all these red dots are control points of your data, and um, we run it right now uh, to compute the difference between the LiDAR and the control point. From directly from the compressed file, and now it's done. And the output is right here in the console because I didn't specify a file. And then you see basically the, the results. The first number is always a difference. Open paved, open paved, that looks pretty good. They're all small differences. Then you come to the forest area, that huge difference is 17 meters. But that's because the data wasn't classified. So you know, you hit a tree. Of course, it's going to be bad. So that worked. Um, ooh, didn't mean to do that. There we are. So now we can, we can have a close look. We select this region here, um, run the viewer, and again we, we work directly from the compressed files. And there we are, because it's, it's spatially indexed, we get them very quickly. And now you see the control points here as, as spheres. And if you press T, you triangulate the data set, and you can quickly sort of see uh, these control points look quite nice. So you can do a visual check as well. Let's um, just pick another region, because somewhere there was a lot of forest. Maybe it was over here. Ah, oh, there we go. That's the bad control points, because they are somewhere in non-classified data. You know, um, the tin, of course, behaves pretty crazy. And the control, but oh, there's one in the open. So that one is good. Um, I think I'll need to hurry up a little bit. So, does uh, LA Elastic work with full waveform? Well, not really. Um, it does. Uh, I actually did a prototype. Um, here you see the LAZ file, and here you see the waveform file um, that is compressed. And if you uh, if you have a look at that file, then uh, let's pick an interesting. It's, it's kind of a boring file, but it's still pretty hard to get access to full waveform data. Um, then you can visualize the full waveforms in here. And they get directly rendered right now from a compressed format. So there you see your waveforms, um, how they hit a little building wherever it's red. The intensity of the wave was high, and it seems there was a little hut here on the on whatever this uh, field. And um, we have some multiple returns here where you first hit here and then you hit here again. Um, and that, yeah, well, I haven't included it in the paper because there isn't a lot of full waveform data there, that, but yes, you can. So, last zip gives you last, this is that, it's lossless compressed, it's the fastest encoding decoding there is, the highest compression, it's tested across terabytes of data at the Army Corps of Engineers. It integrated with a spatial indexing, it's open source and licensed. With LGBL, that means it's free because it's integrated in your own software, so you can read, write, native, LAZ. It's already in Topo.fm 2012 uh, Voyager. Of course, it's in last tools, and uh, you can also get access to it using the PDLs uh, or LibLabs libraries. 
There is support for downloading last in open topography. You know, if you look down here, there is an option here for uh, downloading in LAZ format instead of LAS or ASCII. The Minnesota State Department I said before, this is all the states that are on there already in India. All you see is LAS, and there's a lot of LAS files. Academia uses it a lot, and uh, maybe your company uses it next soon. Should be very easy to parallelize because each chunk can be compressed and decompressed independently. Last 1.4 is coming out. Maybe you've heard a little bit about it. Um, there might be some uh, ways to compress even better for waveform, and I should have a GUI for LASTIP soon. Um, some funding came from the Army Corps of Engineers, and other people helped on um, getting that paper together. Thank you.